All right, ladies and gentlemen, so welcome to the Distance Learning Leadership Summer, preparing for a new era, right? Um, for those of you who are brand spanking new to the whole Zoom nation, this are, these are your controls. Um, yeah, if not, we'll learn as we go, right? Because that's the whole part of this. Uh, we want to thank our, our summit sponsors, TCAL, CDW, Google for Ed, Gaggle, Silicon Valley Education Foundation, of course, uh, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. At the end, there will be an evaluation and I'll make sure I'll, I'll send that up. Uh, but before we do that, um, this is what we're going to be talking about today is digital design strategies, enhancing digital equity through student voice. If you looked at that bitly down there at the bottom, that's where you want to go. But I'm going to do something even better for you because um, for the sake of time, if you look at the chat, I have posted my URL for my presentation there. So you can grab it from there as well. All right. Um, once again, like I said before, my name is Martin Cisneros, and, only, and even though we only have a short amount of time, uh, we can continue this conversation online and all social media, so you can find me at The Tech Profe. All right, and we're off, ladies and gentlemen. So um, how is distance learning looking for you, right? Is it looking a little bit like this? Uh, <laughs> you know, for a lot of you, it's, I know we're still getting used to this, right? And, um, you know, I, I, I get this from a lot of folks is don't you hate when someone's asking how distance learning going is because we're all a little different, right? And if you're a teacher, you just had a taste of it. If you've never gone into distance learning, right? Especially that young woman on the left-hand side of my screen there, right? And, or if not, if you're in the mill, you look a little something like the one in the right because these are our trials and tribulations, right? Remember that wonderful credential program you went through? Yeah, I didn't prepare you for this, did it? No. So anyways, this is why we're here. We're here to learn a little bit, right? And of course, let's not forget about our parents because our parents are learning and going through this whole thing as well. Because just like you, you had a thousand and one tools ready to throw at them and they're staring at you back like this wonderful parent, right? It's like, mm, yeah, once again, you want me to go where and use what and do who, what, right? So. And like I said before, for those of you who weren't part of blending and, and, and digital learning, um, you had a lot of stuff thrown at you. It's like you were going shopping at Costco for the very first time, right? You had overload. So what has happened since then, right? You were all excited once you got your tools, once you got your kids, you know, a gadget. What ended up happening? This ended up happening, right? Your kids starting just, you know, they just started to lose it. They're like, yeah, I've seen this show before. So they start, you know, showing off their camera. They start, you know, cutting off their microphone because the reality is many of your students just went online and then turned everything off and then went to go do what they had to do and come back at 930 when you were all nice and done, right? So what happened? The happen is, of course, engagement. Good evening. I'm your guest lecturer, Dr. Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> I was Can expecting hear that? applause, <laughs> but I suppose stunned silence is equally appropriate. <laughs> I agreed to speak to you this evening because I was told that you're the best and the brightest of this university's doctoral candidates. Hmm. Of course, that's like saying you're the most important electron in a hydrogen atom. <laughs> Because you see, there's only one electron in a hydrogen atom. <laughs> Best and brightest, my sweet patootie. All right, let's begin. Show of hands. Who here is familiar with the concept of topological insulators? <laughs> Don't kid yourselves. <laughs> Uh, I found another tweet from a student at Sheldon's lecture. All right. I would give you more time, but you guys can watch the video afterwards. So it's all about teachers think that, you know, they're engaging even on this side of the screen, right? And for those of us who've been doing this for a while, you understand that, no, things are quite different, right? And, you know, one of the things I, I tell people, um, oh, I didn't say anything about who I am. So I'm a modern learning advisor. Uh, I've been um, in education uh, close to 30 years now. Um, good Lord, uh, you named the, uh, okay, so what I have not taught is first, second, seventh, 10th, and 11th. I've taught everything else from kinder all the way up, uh, taught at four different universities, taught at four different county offices of education. I'm a modern learning advisor. I'm currently the director of technology for the Berryessa Union School District and been teaching online since 2001. 
Yay, all right, that's my rap. So <laughs> when I tell people, it's like, how do you get people to, to really wanna learn? And the reality is you build agency, right? You build agency. You want students to display growth mindset, a great ownership of their own learning because we're all that way. As adults, we, we, we figure this out, right? I believe that, student, that, that all of our kids should have student agency. In other words, ownership, aptitudes, interests of their own thinking. And uh, what we wanna do, especially during this time, you wanna create these change agents, right? But we have to understand that agency is not an app, it's not a tool, it's, it's built upon many different professional, um, um, different experiences, I should say. And there's two types of, 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 of learners, right, when, when we think about student agency, is your, your learner on the left is, you know, knowing yourself um, as a learner, and then there's your other learning, you know, the learner that needs explaining, creating, um, you know, different ways of creating or asking for what is needed to meet their learning needs. And the reality is how do we do this? And, and, and the ultimate vision is for all of our kids to have student agency, but there are um, scaffolds and skills that we need to build for each and every one of them. So for me, um, you know, when, I th when, when we jumped into this and you all remember that wonderful day, it was Friday the 13th of March. You all remember that wonderful day? Yeah, yes, yes you do. Uh, because after that, our world was changed, right? So my head went directly is how do we help develop teacher, students and parents toolboxes to, um, to this whole distance learning? And it's all about hooks, right? So if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to Dave Burgess's, you know, uh, Teach Like a Pirate and now um, uh, uh, Matt Miller's uh, uh, Tech Like a Pirate, you know, it's all about how do you hook your students into learning, right? So I'm going to give you a quick one. Here's just a quick demo about scaffolds, right? So the first thing you know is raise your hand if you use YouTube for learning. All right, great, right? So you might have seen this before. So if I click on here on YouTube, all right, I'm gonna go here and... Lung trouble can come from the air you breathe at work, but thanks to the American Lung Association, you can breathe a little easier. They're working to fight all these lung disease. Your lungs are a miracle. Take care of your lungs. They're only human. And if my lungs weren't... And that guy's pretty quick, right? Y'all, for those of us who are old enough, you remember him. But what if I can go back and then down here under settings on the playback speed, right? I can go in here and I can slow them down. And I'm just gonna slow them down to 0.75%. Check this out. Here. They're working to fight all this lung disease. Your lungs are a miracle. Take care of your lungs. They're only human. And if my lungs weren't in great shape, I couldn't have said all this. Right? All of a sudden, we can understand. So think about your students, right? Think about your parents. So my biggest thing is I'm telling people, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, um, I wish I had more time to, to go over synchronous and asynchronous type of teaching. But when you're doing the asynchronous part, record yourself, record your lectures, record the concepts and then put them up on YouTube, have your own YouTube channel, and then give uh, your students these tools. Like for example, what I'm presenting on right now, I'm presenting on Google Slides, right? And did you know that Google Slides now have this, oh, let me go back here. Did you know that Google Slide now has this wonderful thing? So I'm gonna click on here and position this on the top. But look at this now, right? As I'm talking, you now have closed captioning at the very, very top. What? You've done this before, right? You know, I just got to tell you, I grew up Mexicano. I'm a Latino, you know, straight from the Silicon Valley. And if you were a Latino growing up in the, in the Silicon Valley as a kid, you had to learn how to read the lips of cartoons because there was always a lot of noise going around our home. So we always had the closed captioning on. And the reality is research shows that if, you know, if you have closed captioning on most of the time, students and people just in general retain about 40% of the content that's going on. Right, so this is a simple hack that you can do as you're doing either live sessions or asynchronous sessions. Right, the other component is, you know, like I said before, record presentations with with. There's a variety of different tools they have here with a Screencastify, uh, 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 Spark, Flipgrid. There's a variety of different things. But one of my favorite um, 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 uh, new ones that I I, I just recently um, started to use is something called. Um, uh, 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 immersive reader, right? So this is a, a Microsoft component. So I'm gonna go down here and I am just going to go to Google News and let's find out something in technology. Uh, let's see what's going on today. And Samsung, nope. <laughs> Launching a phone with six cameras, like we need more cameras, all right. But let's just say this is a pretty good article that we want to uh, read. Um, so there's a wonderful new extension called, um, oh, give it time, there we go, called Immersive Reader, right? 
this is from Microsoft. So Microsoft, of course, if this is full of ads now. So what I like about this is... To get started, just select some text on your website, right-click it, and choose Help Me Read This. So this is kind of cool. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to this wonderful um, site. And here's what I'm going to do. Once this pops on, I can now highlight this component, do a right click, click on, help me read this, which is the um, reader. And now not only can this be read back to me, but I also have a variety of different things that I can do with this, right? Um, I can you know, have this break it down by um, syllables, parts of speech, so for it to show nouns, verbs, adjectives. Uh, but one of the wonderful things that I love about this is you can then also translate and it can speak back to you in any language, right? I don't know about you, but for me, um, I've now, I've, 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 been, I've been listening to podcasts since like the beginning of time because as a kid, I've always loved audiobooks. But now I can go to any website in the internet and I can now turn that into a podcast specifically for me in whatever language that I want. What? This is engaging, folks. This is what I'm talking about of how we are building. Um, <clears throat> this is how we build um, engagement with all of our students. So, there's a lot more tools in here, so hopefully I can come back to it. But I want you to think about this whole thing about, you know, teaching like a pirate, right? The first P is for passion. Um, you know, how, how do you show your students that what you're passionate, especially about for teaching? Um, immersion, right? You know, the report. How are you connecting with your students? Um, how do you create this vision of what you want? How do you define the goals that you want to achieve with your students? And, um, you know, think about the transformation because, in education, since I've been on board, we always talked about we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time to do X, Y, and Z. But the reality is that we now have that time, right? Um, when in, in my district, you know, when teachers came up to me, they're like, Martina, what are we going to do about the curriculum? And like, well, the first thing you want to do is take your curriculum and throw half of it out. And they're like, what are you talking about? Which half? And I go, any half. What you're going to find out that our curriculum is bloated and you really need to narrow down what are the, the, the real things that you want your students to get out, right? What are the really things that matter? So this is when I started thinking about, well, how do we, how do we craft engaging lessons, right? What are some of those materials? Um, how do we implement this pirate method that I've heard about, right? So in my head, I always think about, well, how do you, how do you normally engage? It's different to engage when you're one-on-one, -on -one, you know, physically, but when this comes to online, right, there's different types of, of, of presentational hooks. There, there's kinesthetic hooks. For example, I'm going to stop sharing really quick. And I want you all to do something with me. Are you back in? There you are. Okay, let me go back. All right. So, uh, we're, I have too many screens going on. All right, can you all see me? All right, great. So here's what I want you to do. Um, grab your, if, if you're not using it, I want you to grab your nearest um, uh, uh, phone, right? I want you to grab your nearest phone. And go ahead and put it on picture mode, like you're going to take a selfie. Okay, y'all got it? Cool. Here's what I want you to do, right? It's the summertime, ladies and gentlemen. If you still have your old photo on social media, it's time to update, right? The one from you in high school needs to go. I know you love that year. 1989 was a great year, Rosa. I'm seeing you. It was a great year, but we need to update. So here's, here's a cool little tip, right? What I want you to do is turn on your camera and flip it over so it's pointing at you, right? So it's pointing at you, and you're going you're gonna to do this and put it to the side. Now, what I want, all right, all right, I'm looking at everyone. Okay, good. Put it to the side. If you're a lefty on your left-hand side, if you're a righty on your right-hand side. Now, what I want you to do is with your chin, I want you to push it straight up like if you're trying to put your, shin, your chin right through the roof. You're going to feel it stretch right here, right? So we're going to hold it there for about 30 seconds, okay? I want to make sure. Hold it. Okay, I'm going to count down. All right, we still have a few more. All right, 10. Oh, by, by the time I get to one, still hold it up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain some other stuff. We have 10, 9, 
eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Don't go down yet. So here's what I want you to do. As soon as you go down, look straight at the camera and take a picture of yourself. Three, two, and go. Now, for some of you, you probably missed a button, right? But here's what I'm going to tell you. I learned this from a friend of mine who is an a, a iPhone-ographer, right? He takes professional videos with his iPhone. But here's the cool trick. Um, you, know how we, you know how we get older? We get this little chicken rooster deal that happens down here, right? So if you hold that up for 30 seconds and you go down, it holds it up for about two seconds. So you have enough time to take a great selfie, <laughs> right? So this is what I mean when, when I'm talking about this stuff, right? I'm talking about is how do you engage you know, your students. I'm going to share back my screen once again. Um, so here we go. I'm going to share that. And you're there. All right. So can you all see my screen again? Yay, yay. All right. So artistic hooks, right? We have inspiration hooks. We have classroom environment hooks, storytelling, entertainment, and technology hooks. We have so many different things. And of course, we all want to be great. But where do we start is we start by trying out, you know, new tools, finding out different ways of doing this, making connections. You know, how do we collaborate with our kids? And um, there, you know, it doesn't matter, if, especially if you are in middle school or high school, there's different ways to teach and tech like a pirate or distance learn like a pirate, right? So it's time to set sail. So some of the engagement hooks that I definitely want to bring your attention to is if you have not heard of HyperDocs, and I believe uh, there is a gentleman who's presenting on HyperDocs during, during um, uh, uh, this session, attend his session because, you know, people tell me all the time, well, Martin, how do you know, how do we make sure that the kids have the right tools at home that they'll, you know, that they'll be engaged when I go up? Well, it's just a different way of teaching, especially in the synchronous, right? Because if you look here, a hyperdoc is a document that you build out a unit or a lesson in advance, right? You have all the components of good lesson design built in because it breaks it down into chunks of engage, explore, explain, apply, reflect, share, and extend. And as you see, if you go around this graphic, it tells you how it does a variety of different things because that's what you wanna do, right? Any of you ever go to Costco and just go to one aisle and stay there? No, that's insane. You never do that. What do you do? Especially on Sundays. Well, back in the normal days, right? <clears throat> back in the olden days. You would go and you would test stuff out. You would go there and, and like, oh, sometimes you, you would discover stuff that you didn't even know about. It's like, wow, I think I need these new LED lights, security cameras for the small part in my backyard that I cannot see, right? Of course you don't. But the reality is you get to discover. So with a hyperdoc, right? Um, it is a way to package your lesson design, to change the way you deliver the instruction and changes the way students experience learning because it's almost like a treasure hunt in a way. So if you are um, on, on my slide deck, I'm on slide 47. If you click on here, oh, by the way, here's a great disclaimer. We don't have time to go through all my whole um, uh, uh, slide deck. So my slide deck is like an ebook. Once this is over, go back and go back in and click around. You'll find so many, so many, so much content and information. And I always tell people like uh, my amigo over here, John Caripo, right? Um, once you come to any of our sessions, you now have a tech buddy for life. So if you want to talk about this, or you want help, or you want to implement something like this, uh, give me a call. You know, uh, everything except for smoke signals, right? You know, wh whichever way you can communicate with me, and I'll give you my information at the end. But look at this, right? So here is here's here's a hyperdoc, right? And um, a hyperdoc allows you to engage, explore, explain, and apply because. That is the difference between when we grew up and now that our, that our students are growing up, right? We want our students to apply what they're learning. So first of all, how do you engage them? And if you see here, this, these are the instructions for the students on the left-hand side, and these are their tasks, right? And the beauty about this is not, you don't have to just put one type of task. You can put a variety of different tasks because I don't know about you, but um, you know, quick story about myself, you know, I was a migrant kid in here in the state of California and growing up, right, my kryptonite was writing <laughs> because I would see, you know, I was learning a new language, you know, I was learning content and I always tell people, if you're an English language learner, you work four times as hard, but you only get a quarter of the credit for your effort, right? And, you know, it would kill me because it's like, oh, my thing, you need to write this. Oh, my thing, you need to write. It's always write, write, write. Nothing against writing. 
but there's other ways for me to show you what I know, right? And this is what we're trying to get at, especially in today's world. In today's world, we want our kids to show us what they know in a variety of different ways. So with that, right, when you, when you think about the purpose of HyperDocs is, you know, to develop the cognitive thinking um, strategies that students need, right? Uh, repetition and practice, because you're going to use a lot of video. I'm going to show you some resources where we can get different types of video, because a lot of people say, I can't do that because I don't know where you guys get these wonderful videos. I'm going to show you that in a moment. What? Show what you know. Once again, you know, tests can be frustrating when they only show you what they don't know. So what I want you to start thinking about is think about all the different tools that are out there that allows students to show you what they know and once again it's best if they create it it's best if they can just show you with the tools that they know so we're going to talk about building schema in that sense as well right but here's here's one just off the top and i know i'm not doing hyper ducks a whole justice but i'm giving you just like the, the engagement components people always ask me about things well you know i see these all the time especially at conferences like this but i have no clue of where to get these wonderful videos and at the day was, you can tell people now, uh, June 17th at 9.58 a.m., you were today years old when you learned about Class Hook. Check this out, right? So Class Hook is one of those things that I wish they had since the beginning of time. But this is what I mean. Let me close everything else up here. So with Class Hook, it is a, a, a service that allows you to search for any type of video that you want. Now, really quick, I'm just going to pick on somebody. Uh, let's choose, let's see. Oh, I have too many screens going on. Um, let's do this. Okay, Brian. Brian, go ahead and unmute yourself. Brian, give me a topic. Yeah. Uh, Adams. Adams. So I'm going to hit Adams here, right? And now I can select gray level if I want. I'm like, I can select, you know, clip length. I don't want anything over a minute because you all know that, right? Anything over four minutes for, uh, for a modern student is called a documentary now. So you want to keep your videos under four minutes. So from here, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to click on search. And now look at all this. Here's, here's the wonderful thing about um, um, Classhook. What it does, it goes out and finds clips of videos on whatever topic you want, whatever standard that you need, right? What's kind of cool, because it does this with uh, uh, pop culture relevant um, sources. Because if it was up to me, I would show them that wonderful episode of the A-Team. Y'all remember the A-Team? No? You young ones don't remember the A-Team? Oh, Battlestar Galactica. You remember Battlestar Galactica? Oh, no. Not the 2001. I'm talking about the 1980s one. You see where I'm going with, right? I, you know, my references are, are pretty dated if I start going this way. And my students look at me like, what? Is, 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 has he drank his coffee? Is he, is he okay? So I love Class Hook because now I can go in here and talk about, you know, Adams, you know, and, you know, from The Martian, which was a great movie, right? I can go in here once again and type in, um, you know, the word grit. If I type in the word grit, look at this, right? Bruno Mars, Sesame Street, don't give up. It's a song about grit, right? Or I can talk about, once again, the Martian comes up. So what I love about Class Hook is you can use whatever you want, the length, right? This is the type of tool that will engage your students. Yay? With me? Thumbs up usually works. All right. Cool, cool. All right. So getting back into business over here, right? So um, are there more? Yes, over here. Um, there's a lot more tools that you'll see here. And um, how do students apply their knowledge, right? So down here, you have a variety. So um, this is something called a text that I'm gonna dive into a little bit later on. But in here, you have templates, a variety of tools. And like I said before, my slide deck, it's like an ebook. So if you click, you're gonna find yourself into a whole of, of a full day of just learning of different resources, right? So in here, I give you templates about how to connect. In here, I give you tools for critical thinking. In here, you also have tools, um, and my internet is going slow. Okay, here we go, right? Bingo, show what you know. Here are some different, you know, uh, set of tools that you can use. So you can show me, right? Because I don't know about you, you've ever done a PowerPoint presentation with students? And then you sit there and view all of their presentations and you're like, oh, good Lord, what did I do? 
what did I do, right? So for me, it's like, yeah, no, let's cut that off. Why don't I give you, you know, six or eight different choices. You tell me your favorite one. You show me what to do, but you insert it here. And what I mean by here, it could be your learning management system, whether it's Google Classroom, whether it's Seesaw, whether it's Emoto or whatever it is that you're using in your district, right? Um, and there's, of course, a whole lot more it's digital storytelling, uh, screencasting, right? So all these different tools that you see here, um, you'll get from my presentation. So once again, the whole component of engaging students is allowing them to show you what, you, what they know with different formats and, and different ways of, of, of learning, right? So um, to wrap up HyperDocs, right, here are the different layers of learning that's built into a HyperDocs that the reality is we always talk about differentiation we always talk about all these different subgroups that we have in our classrooms, and we always talk about that we don't have the right materials. Well, that is part of the problem. Part of the problem is that, yeah, we're, there is no one size fits all, right? Most of our curriculum is built for the average student, and I'm going to tell you guys a little secret. Ready? Get closer to your screen. I don't know, a little bit closer. Get closer to your screen. I'm going to whisper it because I don't want everyone to hear this, all right? A little bit closer. There you go. Good. I love that you're all close. Um, the is no such thing as an average student. All of our students are different. All right. So once again, you were today years old when you learned about this. So when we get back to the whole, you know, hyper dogs deal, right? Um, you're going to find you name the hyper dog. It's probably already built. You don't need to build it yourself. Um, my high suggestion is take some, a few hours to go into hyperdocs.co forward slash find and everything, whether you're an elementary teacher or you're a middle school teacher, or you're a high school teacher, or if you're a university professor, or if you are a professional learning uh, coordinator, this is the spot that you want to go to and, 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 and build some really engaging um, components. And here's the thing I always get, you know, I always get, every time I do this, like, Martina, how do you know what tools to use? Like, how do you develop that? So the first thing I got to tell you, I've been doing this for a bit, right? But I found there's a certain way of, of, of teaching uh, other folks of how to fish. And what I mean by fishing is how do you fish for tools? So for example, I use something called, oh, go back here, EdTech Teacher. So I'm going to click down here where it says EdTech Teacher. I'm on slide 53, by the way. And when I go there, I go up here to what we recommend. It's at the very top. And then I'm gonna go down here to Apps Tech Tool Guide. I'm gonna click on that wonderful thing. And I love how this works, right? I've been using these guys for such a long time. Um, it asks you, do you wanna learn by activity, by device, or by grade level? Hold up your hand. One, two, or three. Where do you think you should go? Some people say three. I see one. I see people holding up the number 10. No. <laughs> there is no 10. There's only three options. Uh, the reality is go wherever you like, but I'm going to tell you where I go first. I first go through learning activity, right? And I go to learning activity, but the first thing I do is under learning activity, and I'm going to show you why in a moment. Um, I first think about is what do I want my students to do? What's the outcome, right? Because in, 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 in ed tech, we, all, we, we should already know it's not about the tool, it's about the task. So I want my kids to, um, I want them to, to collaborate, right? Yeah, I, I want them to, to collaborate. I'm like, okay. So you hit collaborate and now device. So here's the way as an as, as a, as a online instructional designer, here's what I do. The first thing I think about is what do my students have access to, right? What are they learning? So most of my kids have a Chromebook. Now I can add iPad, I can add whatever, but I'm gonna do Chromebook and then um, I'm gonna leave the grade levels a little bit um, you know, free at the moment. But as soon as I do this, right, down here at the bottom, it autom automatically gives me 25 different entries of how my students can collaborate. And look at this, right? If I really wanna get to, you know, get down, I'm gonna say, you know, pretty much everything. And what I love about it is now it's telling me, oh, here are two different things that your kids can collaborate, you know, all the way through, right? If I undo this, 
I then start looking at Evernote. I start looking at Google Keep at Jamboard. Oh my gosh. If you haven't, you know, played with Jamboard, it is the ultimate whiteboard for all of your teachers, right? Um, since they can't be in the classroom and they have to do distance, Jamboard is the jam. <laughs> but you see what I'm doing here? What I'm going through is I'm looking at all the different things. And look at this. Up here, you can go by the ease of use. So if you have some of those there's teachers that are still struggling, you know, to keep up with stuff, go for the easy breezy ones. But what I love about this is I go through all the devices that I know that my students have, and that's what I choose. And I choose about uh, three to four different um, uh, 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 tools because here's what I do next, right? I don't go in here and learn every single thing about them. All I know is that EdTech teacher says that they can collaborate. So here's what I do. So once we go fishing, right, and there's other tools that allow, um, that, that do the same thing, Common Sense Media, Ed Shelf, Ed Tech Advisor, if you click on these icons, it'll take you there. But it's about building schema, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what I mean. What I do is I break up my class into groups and I'll say, okay, group one, uh, Fernando to Ari, uh, what you guys are gonna do, you guys are gonna use Jamboard, okay? Uh, everyone from Tanya down to Liliana, you guys are going to use our app. And uh, Jeff, you all the way down to Jan, you're gonna use another tool. You see where I'm going? So what I do is I get those four tools, I assign them to the different groups, but they all do the same task. It's just with a different tool. And what I do is, um, if this is due by next Friday, what I want you to do is I want you to build as a group a three minute video of how you use that tool. Because guess what happens? Now, who's training who? I don't let them know that I have no idea how to use that tool. I let them do the work for me. It's, you know, in some places called child labor. I think this is, you know, a good type of child labor, right? And what I do is, is I change it up on them. Every time we do a new experience, I change it up. So that way the students have, uh, uh, they build schema and using different tools. And the best way I tell this to folks is like, if you, you know, remember when you first learned how to cook, right? You put salt and pepper on everything, right? If you're Latino, you put hot sauce. <laughs> that was your third choice, right? But after a while, you can't just put, you know, salt and pepper on everything. You start to add different spices and different things. And that's the thing with learning, right? If we want our students to be, um, you know, if we want them to build agency in their own learning, they need to be exposed to different tools. And these are not big things. You know, we're not doing big projects. We're doing very small projects with them. That way they build their, um, their schema with it, right? So once you have all that, you know, there's, there's other things I always get quite a bit is, well, Martin, you know, um, HyperDocs is great. You know, I, I can see where that can go to building a unit or a lesson. Or what if I just want to do something a little bit smaller? Well, multimedia text is part of building a HyperDoc, but it also can stand on its own, right? And for me, the purpose is about shifting the cycle of learning because you and I grew up in a world of explain, assign, and assess, right? That was the traditional classroom model. And where we need to be at today is explore, explain, and apply. So if, um, for those of you who were here, it was, I believe it was last year when we had this conference in Santa Cruz, uh, Jamie Cassap, uh, uh, um, guy from Google, um, you know, he says something that, that always stuck with me. He says, when, when we were kids, we were all told, um, hey, Brian, right? When you were a kid, they would, they would say, hey, Brian, when you grow up, what do you want to be, right? We all had that question asked to us. But the question we should be asking is, hey, Brian, when you grow up, what wicked problem do you want to solve, right? Because it's no longer about learning the facts. We have Siri, we have Alexa, we have all these different things that we can now ask. The, the thing now is how do we explore? How do we develop the right questions? How do we develop the, the, the curiosity, right? Uh, the intrigue, and then how do we have our kids explain it to in a variety of different formats? And how do we have them apply it to a real world problem? And that's where I'm heading, right? And when you look at stuff like this, like, you know, here, here's, here's a great um, 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 example. So, a topic that we have is about, you know, refugees. So how would you normally explain the topic? Here's one way of using a multimedia text and look at this, right? I'm gonna click on into it. And I just want you to see it. Um, and I want you to see the, 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 the titles. Listen, compare, define, explore, examine, analyze, contact, question, read, watch, read, watch, infer, wonder. After they have all that, now you're able to do something. So in other words, this just took place of my lecture, 
right? This took place of my lecture, so I don't have to, you know, be in front of the students, you know, for six hours at a time in a wonderful Zoom or uh, Google Meet. Now they can explore, and guess what? They're going to be more intrigued. And one thing I really, really highlight about video is that they can pause and rewind whenever they want, right? That's the beauty. Whether it's a video that you found somewhere, whether it's classic, whether it's YouTube, or it's a video that you created using a screencast, right? So there is, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of it here. So with that being said, right, here on the left-hand side is a graphic that shows, um, you know, how multimedia text works and, you know, where in a hyperdoc you can insert it or once again, you know, use it by yourself. So that's some great reading for you. Here's another way of modeling, right? Here's another multimedia text. On the one in, in, in the middle, it's like basically creating a table, right? You create a table and in there, you have them read, you have them watch, you have them experience, right? Once again, you're trying to use as much multimedia as possible, or um, you can do something like we just finished watching, which is called a game board, right? Um, and um, most of the time on the game boards, uh, to differentiate this, I might tell my kids who are, you know, my, my, my struggling ones is like, you know, don't do all of them, you know, choose six out of the 12 that I have here. For other kids, I might say choose eight, you know, depending on, on who they are. And I make sure that on this game board, I have a little bit for everyone. Yay? All right. So student choice, you know, student workflow, all in one, because once again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build schema in all these different tools. And, you know, like, like being a cook, after a while, you prefer certain spices over the others. And that's what kids do. Kids will automatically gravitate towards a tool that they enjoy using more than the others. And guess what? If you make this part enjoyable, yeah, they want to do more. Yeah, they might want to experience a different tool so they can spice, you know, things up. And what I have for you here is um, there's loads of examples, right? Once again, whether you want you know, more reading, writing examples, if you want PE examples, if you want art, music, history, everything is here for you, click away. Um, once again, I am sorry for that. I'm blowing through this like a thousand miles per hour, but <laughs> I wanna make sure you get you know, the gist of this, right? Um, I'm, I'm definitely, 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 you know, the Edu Protocol uh, main guru I know, uh, um, was on this morning, John Carippo. Um, if you haven't gotten into Edu Protocols, it's a really great way, um, especially right now for those of you who are doing um, um, uh, summer distance learning. Um, this pretty much can 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 rock, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, you want to teach better and you want to work less, right? And um, sometimes, you know, technology we think might get in the way of our teaching, but the reality it should enhance what we're doing. And um, what you're seeing right now should not be happening, right? So with that being said, um, you know, what are edu protocols? There are frames that, you can be, that can be reused daily, weekly, and all year, right? Students work on multiple standards. Uh, so people always tell me, well, Martina, how do we get through all of this? Well, do projects. Do projects where multiple standards can come in, um, enhance student engagement, right? Um, can easily be adapted to any grade level um, and ranges of content. And of course, can be paper-based, right or enhance with tech and that's what we really want to be talking about because the reality is if we look at this right this is this has been pretty much our progress for reading scores math and the cost just keeps on going in but we're not moving this right yeah it's and, and, and it's just something that we think about it's like ladies and gentlemen i i know this these past three months have been harsh for all of us but this is also the time and the opportunity to rebuild ourselves right to rebuild on what how to how to really engage with students so when i look at these numbers of of, of schools and and classes that have you know gone with edu protocols and how much um gain that they have done in a short amount of time this is what excites me right so we're going to do a quick one. This one's called the Fast and Curious, right? And the Fast and Curious is a way to build repetition in teachers, especially if you want to recall um, facts. And um, what I like about this, I'm going to put this, I'm going to click on quizzes here. And let's see what the time we have. Okay, we have enough time to play one. So I am going to log in. 
And this is where the fun happens is do I remember my username and password for this one? Uh, there we go. All right, my quizzes. And oh, this should be fun. Um, can you all raise your hand um, if you have English language learners in, in, in your classrooms? I just want to make sure this is the state of California, but you know, you never know. <laughs> right. So we're going to do this one about, you know, um, in, in, um, All right, so what I'm going to do on the chat, I want you to go there and I want you to put this game code on. All right, so let's do this little game. Oh, there we go. So you're coming in. All right, there we go. A few more, a few more. All right, um, I'm gonna count down from 10 to one. If you're in, we're about to go on 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and let's do it. introducing a topic right and let's pretend this is Monday so on Monday I want to see you know right off the bat this is Monday morning and I see that you know my accuracy is 79 percent but then again you guys are whiz kids right normally this wouldn't be as high this would be anywhere between 30 to 40 percent and then I get to look at what the toughest question is right so I'm getting all this feedback I'm like oh I need to revisit what question three is because there might have problems with that, right? And then I look at the longest questions, right? Because it took you guys an average of four seconds to read question three. So automatically, I already know that piece of the content is already going to be troublesome. And then some interesting facts, right? The average time per question was seven seconds. And then what I do is I really don't care about the greens and not that I don't care about your, your, your names. What I care about are these red marks, right? Because that means somewhere along the way, this is where we, this is where we need to go. And I click on the questions. Here's what we do. I take five minutes just to go over all the questions and I talk it over with my students and guess what we do right afterwards. We play the game again and we're at it. Guess what happens to my accuracy? Boom. It goes up, right? Guess what we're doing tomorrow morning. As soon as we come in, boom, we're doing the same thing. And then we go another five minute round and guess what we do again? Boom. You know, we take it again. And what happens to my accuracy it keeps on going up. The first two weeks you do this, right? You're going to see that by Thursday, um, you don't need to do this on Friday anymore. And after a while, by Wednesday, everyone's getting 90% and above, right? Because here's one thing I, I don't tell my students. I don't tell my students, you know, um, there's no such thing as cheating. 
you connect with however you get the information however you need to get the information to get the information right because that's what i want i don't want you not to learn this i want you to know this because in order for us to do our next project you need to know this information and what assessment automatically becomes is oh this is a way to gain information to enhance you know my my agency and this these are one of the strategies called the fast and curious but you know um i wish i had like I, said, I wish i had more time but there are so many other wonderful um, um, edu protocols that really engage your students and have them really not only um, create new modern knowledge, but also reflect on their learning, which is a lot of the time is something that we don't do with our students, right? Um, I gotta move forward because I only have a few left. So I'm gonna leave you with my modern learner teacher toolkit, right? And uh, we went through some of these, but one of the things I, I developed is because over the years is I tell people more and more, we're going to do most of our reading where we're going to do most of our reading online and not in physical books. So check this out. I'm just going to run through it. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to stay afterwards. But check this out, right? Here's the problem. The problem is there's many of our teachers who are going out and finding wonderful um, articles like this. So the first thing that you're going to see is... In a few seconds, you're gonna see all this wonderful noise popping up, right? So what I like to do is I like to use in a Google Chrome extension called Mercury Reader. And when, as soon as I click on Mercury Reader, look at what happens. It takes away all the distractions. Not only that, but I can make the text larger. It changes the typography to either serif or sans serif. Oh, by the way, for those of your students who are dyslexic, this is a dyslexic type of font, which means that they can read this a lot better than normal font. So you can do this to any website. And I like the dark mode because my optometrist said that if I spend more than two hours in front of a screen, um, I should do a variety of things. But this was the number one thing that he told me to do is change the colors so the white light and blue light do not hurt and strain your eyes, right? So this is just by it by itself is called mercury reader the next tool is i always tell this to folks is um how do you know what grade level this is how do you know your students are going to understand this so here's my next tool i highlight the whatever text i'm reading and i go up to my crafty level component and crafty level tells me that in the flesh kincaid reading level this uh these two paragraphs are at 13.6 so this is college level right how many of your students will be able to read that but the reality is the following, right? Uh, the reality is you should highlight the whole thing and what we normally find out, especially on this one, highlight the whole thing, click on crafty level, and we're gonna find out that this is at the 10th, 10th grade, eighth month. Still pretty high, right? So the question I always get, well, Martin, this is great, but you know, what is it really going to help? Well, this is where the other tools come in. So once again, this is called reading the internet. So I use this wonderful thing called TLDR. At first, I thought this meant too lazy, didn't read, but it doesn't mean that. <laughs> uh, so when I click on TLDR, what it does, it grabs that content and it breaks it down for me in four different types of um, length. So if you look on my left hand side of the screen, right, it uses artificial intelligence to do this. Don't trust me. Go ahead and do it yourself, right? Find any article and you can now chunk. You can now chunk reading for the different level readers that you have. But you say, Martin, I, I have more than four different levels of reading. And then that's when I say, well, my name wouldn't be the tech profit if I wouldn't show you another tool that can really do that, right? So if I look down here and I look at something called Resumer, re by the way, I know I'm going through this really quick, but if you click on these, it would it was gonna take you to where, oh, I'm sorry, it's gonna take you to where you can install um, these wonderful um, extensions. So don't worry about that, you'll, you'll have time. But look at this, right? So I'm gonna go back here. And when I go back here, now I'm gonna use something called Resumer. And this is literally my favorite, one of my favorite tools. Um, because with Resumer, it does something what TLDR does. And it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Uh, but it brings me back to my old college days. Y'all remember college, right? It's wonderful times. I'm gonna tell you a reason why. So number one, it, you know, it automatically uh, uh, cuts this pretty much in half for me, right? So it chunks it. I can download this as a PDF doc copy or I can translate this to different languages. I can also do the manual component. And what I love about the manual component is, uh, tell me which, again, what type of level readers do you have? I can chunk this to any percentage that I want. I love this. But my favorite, favorite part is the analyze tab over here. 
here's a reason why. This is where it takes me back to my college years. So back in my college days, I didn't have all the wonderful funds in the world. So I would, of course, go to the used textbook um, place to purchase my books. And for those of you who ever have ever purchased used textbooks, you understand that people love to highlight in their own color. So I would get the wonderful books that were highlighted at least five different times, which means they had five at least different owners, right? And something that would always interest me is the, the, the brown highlighted components. And why were they brown? Because every single color that the previous owner has had, had highlighted that component, which made me to believe is like, mm, maybe I should pay attention to that section because everyone has highlighted. This does the exact same thing, but it uses artificial intelligence. So what it does, it goes to the whole article and it pretty much tells the reader, these are some really important things you might want to pay attention to. What? What? Ladies and gentlemen, I am out of time. I'm actually over time. I wish I can continue with this. I'll be repeating this, by the way, in a few minutes. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna get through. Uh, but what I do wanna tell you is that um, you have all this information. Go back in here, click on stuff. You're gonna learn a lot more. Um, but like I said before, um, one of the biggest thing is, you know, I tell people this all the time with distance learning, humble yourself. Be a student of your students. And if you want, if you have questions, if you want to continue this conversation, my name is Martin Ricardo Cisneros. Um, you can find me online pretty much anywhere at The Tech Profe. I thank you for being here with me today. Um, and with that, for those of you that want to stay, let me bring this over. Where are you guys? There we are. There you are. All right. You can unmute yourselves now. So if you have questions, like I said, I'll be more than happy. I'm gonna stay here. Uh, we, we, we start this show once again in Tampa. For those of you who have to go, thank you for joining us. And please make sure you, you do the evaluations. Thank you so much. Um, and like I said, we can always take this conversation online after, after, after this particular show is over. But other than that, for those of you who are staying around, do, I, do we have any questions? I have a question. It might, yeah, be kind of a dumb question, but um, <laughs> so I've, uh, but your tech is, you're going to know. So I've been doing a lot of the, like during distance learning, I did the um, virtual classroom to make it more engaging. Mm -hmm. And I've just kind of, what, what is the difference between that and the hyperdoc? Because you're saying it's both, you know, it's like, it just looks like a room and they're clicking on things, but I know I shared with someone and then they asked me if I knew how to do hyperdocs. And I was like, I thought this was, I thought it was just a more creatively organized, but right. is, am I missing something? It's, it's the direction. If you look the difference between the multimedia text set and, and the hyperdoc, multimedia text set, it has, um, you know, think of your old, Oh, what were they called when you would go on a journey on the internet back in the 90s and 2000s? I forgot the name of it already. Oh, the web quest. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> You're my people. You understand that. Yes. Okay. So it's similar to that, but where a hyper dog, you're more guy, it's it's more of like um think about Madeline Hunter's, you know, was it six mm -hmm. or seven, right? And mm -hmm. it's just that, but just converse to or modernize and you guide the students in a way where they, instead of telling them, you know, what the problem is going to be, they mm -hmm. discover it. Okay. The hooks come in. This is where the videos, this is where all this other stuff comes in. And the reality is you want to do that for a variety of different things. And, you know, like this, this to me is now the most special thing is, you know, connecting with you live. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a hyper doc or a multimedia text, this is learning that they, they journey on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's the way we, you know, back in the, in the early two thousands, we call this flipping where you, they would, uh, the students would, would, would gather the content in, 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 in a different format, usually video. Mm -hmm. Now they're, they're now gaining, you know, a lot of content because we've all done this before. Right where we jabber for 55 minutes and then you leave the last three minutes to say, are there any questions? And the reality is yes, there are questions,
But no, no one's going to add, no one's going to raise their hand because they want to leave the classroom. And they do understand that they might have understood 65% mm -hmm. of what you said. Whereas when you're doing this with either a multimedia text, specifically in a hyperdoc, they're able to go back and then they're able to do their own pace, mm -hmm. their own place, their own path, right? Yeah. And that allows, especially, you know, a, a person like myself who was an English language learner, it, it allows me to really reflect and, and, and dive deeper and maybe mm -hmm. I get more questions out of it versus me just, you know, you dumping everything on me and then I'm trying to figure out, number one, what you're saying, number two, I mean, there's just so many different variables. Mm -hmm. At least with this, you, they have the opportunity to go back the tools. I wish I would have showed you the other tools, but you know, my thing is with video, with these engagement components, mm -hmm. and then with these tools where you now allow them to take apart mm -hmm. the, the text so they can grab more meaning off of it because mm -hmm. you can't click on a book. Right. You can't, you know, and, and, and you, the chunky part for me was just ridiculous. Uh, read and write is another one that I have in there. But for me is I'm teaching all of my teachers and students how to turn anything into an MP3. So it becomes yes. an audio book, right? Yeah. With read and write, you can do that. And it's just these different things. And these are all just, I, that's why I call this thing digital design strategies. Right. That's, I had for mine for distance learning, I had the, I had it linked to uh, ESL bits, which is the audio, I don't know if you're, uh, you probably are familiar with it, but it reads chapter by chapter and they can change the pace and yeah. uh, they can, there's a PDF, they can look and listen at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I had, you know, like they click the book and it took them to the chapter they were reading. And then I had the interact, you know, they click the something, they click something else and they it took them to the interactive slides that they were going to fill out for it. So I liked it. Yeah, my main issue was just getting him like to sign on to the Chromebook to begin with. <laughs> no, no, no. You, know, you know, I mean, that was the biggest part, you know, <laughs> and or, you know, figuring out how because they're rural getting a Wi Fi connection that would, you know, allow for it. But other than that, I think if I had him in the classroom, I think it would have been a winner. Right. Because they could all read at their own pace. They can, you know, stop but and pause because when you read, naturally you you stop and you think about stuff right you don't just start you know and with a podcast you pause it like if something really resonated with you you pause it process it and then you hit play again whereas in class when we're standing in front of the room we're just blah, 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 <laughs> you know and they right. you know they would all pause at different times but the other question i want to ask that you might know how to do this easily so you might notice in my my background because i don't have a camera on this computer mm -hmm. it flipped it how do i flip it back the other way <laughs> oh just so you know it, it, it looks good on our end it's just on your end that it looks oh good. so you can yeah. read my name and all that yes, oh yay okay because i was like <laughs> i know why is everything backwards but that's the beauty of this right we've all become learners once again it doesn't matter how you know myself included i've been doing this forever but that's why we're here. Rishi, you have a question, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, you know, what I love about the presentation is, you know, your ease, your fluidity, and it, and it shows that you obviously are, you know, somebody who we would probably call a digital native, right? No. Uh, so just really <laughs> quick that it just, it sparks so many things. There's no such thing as a digital native. Okay. We all learn. Doesn't yeah. matter. Doesn't matter. We all learn, including our kids. They know how to use the tech, they just don't know how to use it to learn yet. Right, and so I feel, um, you know, what I'm, I'm striking is I am getting challenges from my, my people who are still needing to learn to get to the fluidity. Um, and so I think part of that time within training the teachers, you know, how, you know, especially in a remote situation, um, is there specific uh, trainings or programs or teaching situations where they can even become familiar with just the concept of, you know, I loved how you threw in that, you know, the quizzes and that model of that situation to get immediate feedback and let the kids see it's, it's good. Um, but, you know, I do have some teachers that struggle because they do try to recreate the in real life classroom through the Zoom where I've 
popped into classrooms and teachers are having their students hold up their work and they're looking at their work on the screen and I'm, and it's, it's almost excruciating to yeah. see. Um, there are so many different things. Um, just want to throw this out there. Oh, good Lord. What's the name of it? California, California Collaborative Something for Excellence. It's happening next week, but I'm doing three sessions with them. And one of them, I'm going to talk about that. Okay. I'm going to talk about, you know, different tools. I'll post, if you follow me online, I'm going to post that up. I think it's already on, on my Twitter. So you'll find all the information if you want to. I'm doing three classes, 45 minute classes. But long story short is this. Teachers need to understand that um, when, when, when you are doing distance learning, um, you're not on the full time, right. you know, you're on, you know, and it depends on grade levels, but, you know, from 20 minutes to 45 minutes at a time. And during that time is how do you learn how to engage, how to go back and forth. It's like really tune in. Um, like I said, only because I knew I wanted to break, I wanted to do breakout stuff, but just because, you know, time, we only have 55 minutes. And basically this is a three hour presentation that I normally do, just chop for it. But uh, my suggestion is the following, um, top skills that the teachers need to know how to do is multimedia text. That's like my first one. How do you build that out? So that way they have, they can give stuff to students and the students can learn about the topic from a variety of different things. And number two is learn how to screencast. I know there's, you know, Khan Academy, there's all the, you know, uh, uh, crash, crash course, there's all these wonderful videos out there, but I always tell people, I go, a skill that every educator, whether you're an administrator, you're a paraeducator, you're special ed, EL, it doesn't matter, learn how to screencast because what we found out through research is that when you screencast, kids already know you. They have that trust with you. They have, you build that rapport and they also know your cadence. And what I mean by that is your flow of learning. And as you probably have all experienced in this past 55 minutes, don't you wish you could have paused me and rewound me at certain points? And that's because I didn't even go into a lot of the tools that I had in there. Um, but I say this as a student, I say this as a parent, I say this as a, 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 an administrator is I, you know, for emails, 60% of my emails, it's just me um, sending you a, a screencast of what you need to do. And I cannot tell you, we just did a survey for all of our parents and all of our uh, teachers about distance learning. And they all said, keep that up. Whatever, whatever that was, that is great because that's how we like it. And guess what? I'm doing 45 seconds. I'm doing, once again, like I said before, nothing over four minutes because anything over four minutes, it's a documentary. I see it's 1038. We're about to rewind this and 